Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Many people are talking all about how to build a positive work culture because, of course, it's so key to our well being. Not to be a Debbie Downer or anything, but it's probably more common to work in a dysfunctional culture than a positive one. And that's why I brought on today's guest, Nancy Board, co founder and COO of Global Women for Well Being. Nancy is a longtime EAP professional, that's Employee Assistance Program, experienced in corporate health and well-being globally, and a leader in workplace mental health, trauma response, risk management, and women's issues. A bit about Nancy's background, she was previously the Vice President of Healthcare, EAP, and Wellness for J.P. Morgan in the Asia-Pacific region, responsible for over 38,000 employees in 18 countries. Having also led individuals, teams, and organizations through the chaos and grief of workplace violence and major disasters, Nancy has a unique lens from which to gauge and teach personal resiliency, recovery, and trust. As co-founder of Global Women for Wellbeing, she's passionate about doing more good to create gender equity and build inclusive, respectful workplaces for women to become thriving, healthy leaders. Now, if you haven't already noticed the background noise, I, it is spring in North Carolina, and I have my window open, birds chirping, and of course, buses going by. So forgive the noise. Nancy and I discuss the characteristics of a toxic workplace, the negative impacts on well-being, and then what to do about it. And of course, with the Me Too movement, we have to talk about sexual harassment and what to do if you personally are experiencing sexual harassment or a coworker is experiencing it. Nancy leaves us with a tip on how to protect your mental health when working in a toxic environment. And, you know, we talk about that all the time is you can't put a wellness program onto a toxic work culture and expect to have fantastic results. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But after I talk to some wellness professionals that are being tasked to do exactly that, and I know it can be very mind numbing for many of you and mentally taxing. And also after this discussion with Nancy, it made me feel very lucky about my work experience. You know, even though I've worked in cultures that didn't fit my personality, they were just bad culture matches. You know, of course, there was some dysfunction in some of the where where I worked. And, you know, I've got my share of stories about work conflicts and bad bosses and being a bad boss, et cetera, et cetera. But I never felt like it was toxic. I never felt like my safety was threatened. And so really, I, I empathize with the people who are going through this on a regular basis because it is a really hard thing to go through. Before we dive into the interview with Nancy, I want to encourage you to join me and friends on a private Facebook group, the Redesigning Wellness Community. What we are are a group of like-minded wellness professionals who want to change the status quo of wellness in a very positive way, and uh, it's very helpful. A lot of people will jump in and respond if you have a personal question or a challenge or you need a resource. So if you want to join us, feel free, just hop over to Facebook and in groups, search Redesigning Wellness Community. I do ask you a couple questions just to prove you are a human and not a bot, and then I'll let you on in. So please join us. All right, let's go ahead and dive into my interview with Nancy Board. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Nancy, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. So glad to have you on today. Thank you, Jen. It's a pleasure to be here. And with your background in mental health, you know, I wanted to take an interesting twist and and utilize your mental health background to talk about toxic work cultures. Because, you know, we talk so much about culture and, you know, how we can improve it. But the fact is that there are a lot of negative and toxic work cultures out there. So I want to start off by just defining it if you can. Let's just go ahead and give give everyone the same definition of a toxic work culture. Sure. And you're absolutely right, Jen. This is a topic that, you know, you and I have been in this business a long time and we define 
and look at culture, but I rarely hear anybody talk about it from a toxic perspective. So let's just kind of level set with the definition here. What I refer to a toxic workplace culture is one where there's a, what I call an extreme power imbalance, a lack of trust, a lack of safety, where employees are actually fearful and they're, they tend to look over their shoulders. You know, there's gossiping going on in the workplace. You might even be identifying with some of this. I would guess most of our listeners have been in a workplace like this where there's uneven power dynamics and that the organization is not inclusive. There's competition and sometimes competition thrives amongst the employees and the teams or you'll have one team that, you know, is constantly fighting or in competition with another or a department, if you will. And that there's sort of this overprivilege sense. And it, it tends to come, honestly, from male dominance. And that's been what our society has developed over eons of years. So that's sort of how I define it. And I think for most of us, I don't know, maybe it's just me that's been in a toxic work environment, but, but does that resonate with you? Can, you? can you identify with a workplace like that? Well, I'm struggling a little bit, to be honest, because I've been in workplaces that didn't kind of lift me up and didn't feel like they fit with my core personality. Like it just was a mismatch. I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't be myself, but I don't know if I would personally define it as toxic. And so when you, when you labeled, you know, maybe not being able to trust your managers or or competition, honestly, part of that sounds like business as usual, right? People compete. So where is that line between, you know, hey, people are just competitive. It's just human nature. And when it gets to that toxic standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Good point and good question, because I think there is a continuum on this anyway in general. But I've I've talked to so many women in particular about this aspect. And, And I'll just give you a couple of examples, because I actually have worked in organizations that were very toxic. And what I mean by that is that, It's so blatantly toxic when you walk into these organizations that you can see it, feel it, almost sniff it out. And and there's yelling. You know, I've been in organizations where people are yelling at each other. They're visibly angry with one another. The gossiping becomes part of what people do. And again, I've seen it from labor and management levels. I've seen it amongst organizational teams and departments uh, where there's mistrust. And so, you know, where does all of this come from is a good question, but it, it tends to just have developed over time. And so if you've worked in an organization where you've, you've had some unease or some issues that maybe don't help you thrive, I think that is very different, frankly, than an organization that sort of from the top down has these ingrained ways of operating so that, for instance, if you were to try to thrive or you wanted to get along with other teams or departments, that you would bump up against some resistance. And I think that's one way to tell kind of behaviorally if you're in one of those kinds of settings or not, that doing the right thing or doing the healthy thing might bring some resistance. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes complete sense. And and that really helps because I think it goes beyond dysfunction, right? I've worked on plenty of dysfunctional teams and (laughs) dysfunctional or, you know, departments, but yeah, that that does bring it to a whole new level. And, um, you know, I I think everyone understands there's negative impacts on employee well-being, but talk about like some of the stats around it or some of the research or just kind of what you know about the impacts of a toxic work culture. Yeah, well, th- let's just think about this for a minute. And I, and I hope our callers can at least try to put themselves in this position. And, you know, when you think about any of us that have been in these environments where you go to work, you know, sometimes for people, it's tough enough just to get up in the morning, depending upon what their life circumstances are to get up to, for, for many people be caught in a commute to get to the workplace. There may be this pressure that, that one has to be there at a certain time. So, the, so people start off their days often with this enormous amount of internal stress, because most of us want to show up at the workplace doing the right thing, getting there on time all of those sorts of things, you know, the pressures we put on ourselves anyway, let alone what baggage we have in our own lives. But you get to the workplace and if, and if there is this sort of toxic culture or 
power dominance culture, then it intensifies by, you know, people can feel it inside, this increased level of stress. And it can manifest as sadness. It can, it can manifest as depression. It very often manifests as being distracted. I mean, I, I think back on some of the workplaces where I was and even my own teams, I could tell that they were distracted because they were witnessing some of this, what I call toxic culture or craziness, you know, going on between teams or, or between individuals in the organization. And what's interesting, I think, about it, too, is that if you don't come from a toxic background and for those who do, you know, for those people who grew up in a dysfunctional family, let's say, or other environments where you've seen this sort of bullying and it could be harassment, it could be just anger and fighting going on, that for many people it brings up an enormous amount of fear and, and not really knowing what to do. So, you know, when you think about that from a productivity standpoint, I, I know I've been around teams that have just shut down and they've stopped what they're doing, or they're trying to find an excuse to get out of the office or go to another team or department. They're trying to distance themselves from these micro and what I call macro aggressions that can happen. So again, it can be, it can be infighting. It might be bullying. It might be you know hearing somebody vent behind a closed door. It, it could be direct retaliation. But when we think about it again, from a productivity standpoint or presenteeism perspective, there's an enormous amount of emotional energy that's being wasted just trying to cope. And so what happens, I think, to all of us is that eventually that's going to build up. So toxic cultures create toxic situations where I think people end up getting sick, you know, mentally, emotionally, and certainly they can become physically sick as well. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you say to the people who say, we'll just go get a new job? Oh, yeah. Well, that's plenty of people say that. And for many people, that's an option. And I've been in workplaces where literally within one week, I've had teammates that have come into an organization thinking that it was a great situation. And within five working days have said, that's it, I'm out of here. And they had that confidence. They had that belief in themselves. They felt that they could find another job, all of that. But, but think about it. There are plenty of professions and plenty of people who don't feel that it's that easy to just step away from that situation, that they can just walk away. So yeah, it, any of us can say, oh, just go somewhere else. That's easy. But the truth of the matter is, is that really most people, I think, stay in positions because they feel the financial pressure to do so. And therefore, either they get sick and ultimately become part of the toxic culture, and, and in many ways, they may become uh, a perpetrator as well. And I'll talk about what, what I mean by that term, because that may sound like a pretty strong term. But they become part of the cycle, because it's it, just like a dysfunctional family or situation. The more you're in it, the more you become part of it, too. So it's challenging to put up some barriers to it. And I actually do have a couple of recommendations about how to counteract a toxic culture. But for the most part, many people do feel compelled that they, they have to stay. It's just not that easy for them. And so developing coping patterns are going to be crucial if one is going to exist and try to keep a distance from, from the toxicity. Yeah, because I imagine if you're sitting there in the, the toxic work culture and it just takes up so much mental and emotional energy... And you probably want to go home and just veg. You probably don't want to go look for a job. It just takes so much bandwidth to go home and put more energy into something you know you need to do, but yeah, you don't have sure. the mental or emotional capacity to go do it. And, you know, I, I'm looking back on a couple of places where I've been personally, and, and I've had staff that have come to me that have said, you know, they've heard things or they've witnessed things and have said, that's not appropriate. That's not acceptable. And I said, you're absolutely right. It isn't. And so we would have one-on-one sessions. I, as a manager, coaching my employees about what was happening, uh, what their options were, what we could potentially do or not do about the situation. And, you know, just, just trying to be that healthy voice of reason, frankly, um, 
in some of these situations. I'm thinking of a job I was in for about four years and, and one of my teammates was also there for about that amount of time. And I really knew that I provided a buffer for her from some of the, the stuff that was happening at the senior level in the organization. But because we were still somewhat small and we were all on one floor, she, she heard this. She heard things that I would consider inappropriate, you know, screaming and yelling, for instance. So for some people, screaming and yelling may be, <laughs> may be the way they operate and, and they don't have any issue with that. But for most of it, I think, especially workplace wellness professionals would say, well, that's not appropriate. You know, that, that's, um, you can't be that way in the workplace. You know, that sort of thing. So it helped because I was, a, I was able to um, have her, she, she was in a customer facing role, so she could be out of the office more often with our customers and clients, which was good for her. And she certainly believed in the mission of the organization, but she was really, really torn by this behavior, and, and rightly so. So, okay, the yelling, yeah, I, I can't really put wrap my, my mind around that because I've never worked in an organization where people have yelled at each other. I have heard a manager and employee yell at each other in a like this little glass area. And I heard that, but, you know, for me, it's been a lot of, not for me personally, but for my experience, it's been more passive aggressiveness. Mm. And so what are some signs? Like, so if someone's listening to this and they're going, yeah, I'm not I'm still really sure. Cause I think, I think sometimes we don't realize what we're in. Right. So are there right. any particular signs, even maybe behaviors, maybe attitudes, or maybe feelings. Like I always heard that, you know, people going in on like Sunday night, they started getting like the feelings like, oh, I don't want to go in tomorrow. But what are maybe some signs that people can tune into if they're just really still not sure? Yeah, I love that question, Jen, because I think the one you just described is a perfect example. When people say, oh God, I really don't want to go into work tomorrow. What what is that about? Now, Now, one, it may simply be that that one is drained by having been there, you know, the week before and the weekend, let's say uh, it was just a weekend that, that you had off, that that's just not enough time to recuperate. Or, you know, maybe you were having a, a wonderful time with family and that's really where you would rather be, rightly so. But for many people, it can, you know, these signs can be, they can be very subtle and they can also be very direct or blatant. But when you talk about passive aggressiveness, I think, yeah, what, what all of us need to kind of tune into our bodies. And I always talk about this from a mental health perspective anyway, because our bodies have information that sometimes our minds or our emotions aren't really even aware of. So check in with yourself and say, wait a minute, you know, I feel like I'm getting a stomach ache or my shoulders are tight and tense. What, what's going on here? What, or, or a headache develops or, you know, a migraine or something like that. Sometimes these kinds of situations create the, these somatic symptoms that are indicators that something deeper is happening. Because when you talk about passive aggressiveness, that's a really interesting dynamic that is quite under the radar in some ways. It can feel uh, confusing for yes. many people. Mm -hmm. I, I tell our audience to Google the term gaslighting. And Jen, that's a concept that you might be familiar with as well. But I've seen that play out. Um, I've been a victim of gaslighting. What is that, Nancy? I don't know what it is. So, so that's when someone has an intention of, um, it can be an extreme and a subtle form of intimidation that sort of says, you're crazy, I'm not. And it, it, it's, uh, you often see this in relationships between men and, men and women. And again, I'll, you know, I'll just talk quite transparently here that I've been a victim of this in a relationship where I felt something was seriously wrong in the relationship with my partner. And his role with me was to continue to say, oh, no, there isn't. No, I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. You're the crazy one. You're putting things into your head. Where are you getting these ideas? And it was all about putting it back on me to the point where I began to question my reality. So what I was seeing and, and my reactions were so severe. So what was happening is he was quite calm and I was finding myself very emotional in terms of angry and upset to tears and this sort of thing. And then I had to question myself and say, oh my gosh, 
yeah, I really am reacting. What is going on? So I start second guessing myself. In the long run, Jen, what I learned was that my instincts were right all along. There was a lot of stuff happening in this relationship outside of me that was wrong, that was inappropriate, and that bordered on being illegal. And finally, I got out of the relationship. It ended up that all of this was revealed about a year and a half later. What do you mean revealed? It came out, it became public. Got it. That what I sensed was happening actually was the truth. So when, when your own integrity gets questioned or your own position of reality can be questioned, it's just something to really think about. And, and what I say to people, frankly, is that if you feel confused or you are a victim of harassment or bullying or some sort of level of gaslighting or whatever, get professional help. If you're in a workplace, use your EAP because most workplaces have an employee assistance program. And frankly, most employees don't use that program. But there are professionals there and available at no cost to employees to actually talk through any kind of an issue or any kind of concerns that one may have. And particularly when it's impacting your own health and well-being. And I'll I'll just, okay, first of all, thank you for sharing that very personal story. I really appreciate that. And and I just want to pile onto that, that counseling can be so helpful for people. And even if you don't, like, if you don't connect initially with the therapist with your first one, find another one, find another one. Because I remember I had an employee on my team quite a few years ago, and she was going through a, a divorce. And I said, okay, go to EAP. Of course, you know, like, like that's where, you know, we, we, tr- we trust um, the provider there. And she's like, I went to a- EAP, but it made me feel like it was my fault. Like the, the counselor was just saying, reflecting and going, well, it sounds like you've got it pretty good. What's wrong? What's wrong with you? And that's, and that's what she took from it. And, and I don't give that example to say, don't go to EAP because absolutely do. Right. But just because that one counselor's not a fit, they can refer you to others. Oh, that's exactly right. So, uh, People absolutely explore your EAP um, at your organization because it is completely confidential. But if you don't find that right fit initially, there are a million other counselors out there that you can connect with. That's absolutely right. And thanks for saying that, Jen, because I would not want anybody to think that they got to somebody's door and that they had to accept any guidance or response. Same thing with your physicians. Yes. Now, any professional that we choose to seek out, if you know in, internally and you don't feel that that's a good fit or you don't necessarily agree with what they're saying, there's always second opinions. And I'm a, I'm a big second and third opinion person, so I couldn't agree more. Yeah, the physicians one too. Yeah, if you feel like you don't want to go back, then that's a sign. <laughs> right, right. Now we couldn't get, you know, talk about a toxic culture without talking about sexual harassment. And, you know, I want to talk about two types. One where you, maybe you just feel uncomfortable, but you aren't sure if it's true sexual harassment, you're questioning, right? And then the second one is overt. Can you talk about that? So I have talked with so many women about this subject, and I must say, particularly since the Me Too movement has come out. I've written about this already. I'm doing workshops, speaking engagements on this topic. And I'll tell you, I just had a conversation with a woman yesterday. And one of the things that came out of that was, in essence, when women are feeling uncomfortable in the workplace because of who they are, you know, their their body, their image or whatever, you have to start paying attention to those signs from the get-go. So to use your example, what if somebody did something and I just felt uncomfortable? My God, I don't know a woman that that hasn't happened to. I, I don't. I don't know about you, Jen, but I, I know in my world, virtually every single person that I've talked to and what, and, and I've witnessed some things that I've said, oh, that's not appropriate. Mm-hmm. What, what someone said or the way in which someone looked at this person, whatever the case was. But individually, the, those kinds of, let's call them microaggressions, if you will. So, so something happens and it's, it's not that somebody actually grabbed a body part of yours. I don't, I don't know what it could be, you know, but it's something that you just felt uncomfortable. Maybe it's the way somebody was looking. So there's that visual component that women, I think, experience quite often. Then there's the touch. Okay, so if there's a certain touch or 
you know, this genuine reaction that one has in their body. And typically for women, we experience it in our bodies. And so often the instinct is, oh, I'm at the workplace. Oh, just, you know, it's okay. He didn't mean anything. I think women in general have a way of always trying to sort of blow things off and not make a big deal out of it. But then there's those, as you say, the very blatant, overt signs, which which are obviously, you know, some of the issues that we've heard from people that have been in the media and, and some of the horrific things that they've done. Okay, so everybody would say, yeah, that's wrong. That's overt sexual harassment. But typically this stuff starts out as, again, what we might call microaggressions, and they build. And the reason it's important to talk about this along the lines of toxic workplace cultures is because of that phrase, again, toxic workplace culture, and power imbalance. So this sort of thing tends to happen where there's power imbalance and there's been, the way I describe it, particularly when it's men against women, it has to do with the socialization and our culture and many cultures, frankly, around the world, where, again, it's, it's not so much about sex, it's about power. And when one has been raised a certain way or one has been, one has experienced their own pain and traumas, they may end up acting out in the workplace because, again, that's where so many of us spend so much of our time. So it's not to say that there can't be, you know, lots of relationships happen in the workplace, right? You know, people Mm -hmm. find people that they're interested in and and, and all of that. And that's that's different. That's fine. But when there's this power dominance thing that starts to happen, that's not okay. And so from the call I had yesterday, the woman said, we have to all be treated as humans, you know, and stop looking at this from a gender lens or a sexual lens, but just as human beings. And gosh, I think we have a long way to go to really maybe approach it from that perspective. I really hope there's more cultures and workplaces out there, Jen, where this isn't the case. But I guess because I've de- delved into this so much and this is so much of my work, I tend to see it from the opposite side where they're still, where I'm trying to hopefully have an impact where cultures have been more toxic than healthy. Right. Well, think about, you know, the wellness professional and there, there's a lot of women, you know, I, that's I, right. They may work in gyms. Um, they may work places that, uh, I guess the gyms is what one thing that, that came to mind because the person that I, I knew worked in a gym and then this person, this employee would come by and just make creepy comments. And um, yeah. so what, what do women do? Like if they're, what's your advice to them if they're experiencing regardless, you know, overt or something that just makes them feel uncomfortable? Sure. Well, let me just share an, an example that happened just last week. I was interviewing a young woman that was 26 years old and um, extremely articulate and very, very clear about sort of her passion and her and what she wanted to do in her life. And she just sat with me and she said, you know, I'm so glad that you're part of this organization. And I was telling her about GW4W and our mission. And she said, it's so needed because women my age she said, we, we all experience these aggressions in the workplace. And she said, you know, and, and then she went on to tell me an example that she just left a company and is now trying to be an entrepreneur because she, she said, quite frankly, yeah, they said that, that I ticked all the boxes on my resume, but she said they were more concerned about my backside and how I showed up and, and what I looked like. And, and so this sort of thing, and just, just like the example that you used, I think is so prevalent, particularly, again, with younger women. And I don't know, you know, about what you've experienced in your career, but this has happened to me for for many years in the workplace. And, you know, some of us are more confident than others. And this sometimes gets down to a level of understanding our confidence, understanding what are the risks involved if we say something. So so think about it. Something's just happened, a microaggression, uh, if you will, and there's got to be dozens of thoughts going through someone's mind at the time. What do I say? How do I respond? What's the look on my face? What's going to happen if I say something? 
Am I going to lose my job? You know, that's just five right there. But those are happening within a matter of just a few seconds. And depending upon, as I said, what a, what a woman's maybe confidence level is or experience with speaking out for herself, that will determine what, what she says or does. I think that if we don't say something immediately, if we don't step in and defend ourselves, we give this behavior permission to continue. And so, it, you know, for some women, they may say, but I, but I, I still can't. I can't say anything. Again, that's, it's, it's about stepping back finding someone that you can talk to about this and check it out. It could be, it could be a man, it could be a female confidant, but, but there needs to be a way to not push the stuff under the rug because little microaggressions turn into big macroaggressions. There's always something that leads up to this. It's never a surprise. You know, when, when you find out that Harvey Weinstein was a creep and did all the stuff that he did, Everybody knew that, right? I mean, that's, that's what, and it's the same thing in the workplace. People rarely ever, when something big happens, says, oh, I'm so surprised. Yeah, they're like, it's about time. <laughs> yeah, they don't say that. They say, oh yeah, I've seen this over and over and over. And so what we all need to do, and this is men included in the workplace, is begin to start challenging what we see that's inappropriate from the beginning so that these things don't continue. And I'll get to this in a minute. There's a little exercise that I've used with women to try to help them when they're up against someone where they feel they're they're being bullied or harassed or whatever. But but back to, to one point I wanna make, Jen, before we get too far into this, and that is that when you think about retaliation, because that's one of the that's one of the issues I mentioned that I think a woman often thinks about you know, retaliation can be from a mental well-being perspective. It can be, it can impact a woman's financial well-being if it means she loses her job or has to go find another one and there may be some time without pay. So physical retaliation, emotional and psychological, and then the financial aspect of this. So that's, that's all playing through someone's mind when they think about what do I do? What do I say? Mm -hmm. And it, that's why it's just so important that we begin to speak out about this stuff earlier rather than later. And Nancy, you're making me feel very fortunate because in my career, I think it's because I'm sitting here thinking like, I think it's because like I worked in female dominated professions, you know, working in public health with a bunch of other dietitians and females and then going to worksite wellness in a hospital and my team were all women. And then you know, even getting in the corporate world, there was only like one incident that made me feel uncomfortable. And it was with an external person, not even with someone with a company. But there was this one incident that happened and um, a younger wellness professional felt very uncomfortable. And my advice to her, she didn't report to me. I was like, go report it. And she didn't feel comfortable. So she went to her boss and let her know. But like, I was like, I'm not surprised this happened. You need to report this. But of course, I didn't feel comfortable going to go report it because that's not my place. Like I didn't... Mm -hmm. I didn't want to make her put her in an uncomfortable situation. So I'm curious, you got my mind peaked about what, what do you do? Like if you are up against something like this or bullying or any of these toxic behaviors. Right. Well, well, one thing that just comes to mind and for so many women, it's that, what do I do? Who do I talk to? Sometimes people are not comfortable going to HR. Now, when people aren't comfortable going to HR because they feel they can't trust the people there, that's a problem. That's a concern in general. And that's just not that unusual. And look, I, I've got an HR background. So I've, I'm so supportive of HR professionals because they, we are wearing so many hats. And so we, HR professionals, can't be the end-all, be-all of any organization. But they, they do have to operate, much like uh, an EAP counselor or a consultant is, as someone to listen, as someone to hear what's happening, and to be able to take that information and document it and say, this person came to me and spoke about this. I need to keep my eye out for this. And Jen, I say that in the same way that I, I, I'm thinking back on the same company now, and I'm thinking back on a particular employee 
that came up in a, in a management meeting because people felt afraid of this individual, not from a bullying or harassment perspective, but they thought that his, his behavior would lead to violence eventually. Wow. And so when I think about what it takes, and we're talking about, you know, again, the bigger picture of toxic workplace culture, all of these kinds of things feed into this, which is you got to say something, because if you don't, keeping quiet doesn't serve anyone and it doesn't help to make things change. And as we've seen, it takes a lot of brave women to step forward for change to begin anyway. But so whether it's a, you know, someone you're worried about who you think could, could eventually be violent or someone who you feel intimidated by because bullying and harassment has been part of the culture and allowed to happen in that organization. Any of that starts with finding someone safe to talk to, human resources. In that situation, should I have gone to HR and said, so and so, not not the person, you know, kind of reporting the incident, but so and so, somebody said that this person was, (laughs) you you don't want to go to anyone with like not having facts, but would it have been better for me to go to HR and said, just keep your eye on this person? I've heard X, Y, and Z. Well, that's an interesting and a great question, Jen, because I think it's one that any peer or, you know, any teammate of a worker is going to feel concerned about. I would do it this way. I would say to that person, let's go together. You know, I'm happy to go with you. I'm happy to be there and support you. I would not do it for them because one, everybody has to do it for themselves. You know, if you speak up, before somebody else is able or willing to, that can be a disaster for whatever reasons. The other thing you can do is be there to say, if I visibly see anything like this happening, I'm going to speak up. Okay, so as a peer, you're going to say to aggressor, I just saw what happened. That's not okay. You may also then grab other peers and just say, you know, if you guys see anything like this happening, Let's bring it up. Let's confront it. Because it, it's, it's certainly part of a bigger problem. And you're probably not the only one who has felt that way or, you know, seen anything that way. So it's about supporting that person, but not doing it for them, if that makes sense. That makes complete sense. Yeah. I, I like that, that advice. Um, so like thinking about spotting signs of a toxic work culture, are there any signs maybe before accepting a job? Yeah, that's a great question. So One of the things that I've always done, and and I know many people do, is, you know, so you're, let's say you're interviewing at a company, and there's lots of ways, I think, to have your radar up on on these sorts of issues. I often have said to people, get there early for, for, let's say you're, you're interviewing on site at a company, get there early, sit in the lobby, watch, look, and listen. There is so much you can tell from an organization by, you know, let's say they have a reception area desk and there may be a person or two behind that desk. Watch, look, and listen to that person. Are they happy? Are they smiling? You know, what's their demeanor? Do they seem stressed? What are you picking up um, in terms of what's happening just around you? If employees are coming in and out, are they, how, how do they appear? What do they sound like? How are they dressed? All these kinds of things. But also, also go on glass door. And check out what people are saying, because even in some situations, there can be underlying toxicity that isn't always talked about or advertised as, as you know, some of these companies, it's their PR. So they're, they want to be seen as employers of choice, and they want to brag about how great their cultures are. But go on Glassdoor and read everything, and then try to weigh out you know, what the scores are. Because if you have disgruntled employees, they're going to speak, obviously. But I think you have to weigh that. You have to kind of look at it across the spectrum and say, what are people saying that's really great? What are people saying that's awful? And then try to find where the truth may lie in between. And if there's consistencies, I always look at the glass door. Always. Yeah. If you're if you're seeing common threads among the the comments, that that can also be very helpful. Yeah. Because there's always those there's always those pissed off employees that (laughs) are absolutely and then. But then thirdly, you know, talk to former employees, obviously, because so often these days people get to jobs by networking. They get there through a friend recommended them and referred them. So I would also say to a friend of mine who would say, 
hey, I want to bring you on to this company, I would say, I want to talk to somebody who's not there anymore, you know, who maybe worked in this area or, or maybe worked in a different area. Who can you, who do you know that, that I can connect with who's no longer there? So that you kind of have a balanced opinion of what's happening. Mm-hmm. Good advice. Now, okay, so what if, like, for whatever reason, no judgment, an employee needs to stay in a toxic job? What can they do? How can they protect their mental health? Yeah. So a couple of things here. As like with any movement or any change initiative, it really takes each person individually to try to create a better environment for themselves. And so I would encourage people to find their own informal support systems and support groups, perhaps, within their workplace or even outside of their workplace. I mean, I've been part of a, as an example, I've been part of a women's circle for many, many years, and we would meet every other week, and I would always take any issues that I was struggling with in the workplace to this group of women because it was confidential. They would be able to support me in maybe role-playing how I wanted to talk to someone or what I wanted to do, but it was an opportunity And I knew that I could kind of contain whatever was going on because I could take it there and share it. Same thing with, you know, using an EAP or or some some other kind of confidential confidant. But but the other thing that I do, Jen, and and I've taught this to, to women in particular, I was talking to a physician just a couple of weeks ago, frankly, and she was struggling with a peer, another peer physician at the workplace that was you know, in her words, was was really acting like a bully to her. And so I taught this exercise to her and she could picture herself in that role. And she was really grateful for it because for her, it stirred up a lot of fear and anxiety when she thinks about interacting with him. And it's what I call a shrinking exercise. So what I mean by that, and I've used it, I've used this plenty of times in the workplace when I've come up against someone who it's evident that there's a power imbalance, I feel intimidated, or there's this bullying or harassment happening. And I look at that individual, whatever their size happens to be, and I shrink them in my mind, and I shrink them down to sort of a little 10-year-old, 8 to 10-year-old child. And typically it's a man. So I've done it where I've shrunk them down to an eight to 10 year old boy. And I've done this, whether we're standing up or I've been called into the CEO's office. And I've done this where I see this person sitting across the desk as a little child. And what it does for me is it just really settles me down because in many ways, psychologically, that could be the case. And what I say to people is that when there's fear and intimidation coming from the other side, It's usually because that's someone who has been hurt somehow in their life. And I always say that hurt people hurt people. And so when I shrink them, for me, I know that I'm the adult in the room and I lose that fear and that sense of confusion and I'm able to concentrate and I'm able to kind of hold my own power and position. And I don't try to get one up on that person. I want to interact much more in an equal power situation. But I also realize that I'm not one, one back, one foot back on, on the situation. So I talk to women about this all the time. They can picture themselves in that position. And they told me that it's been really helpful for them as well. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. I was actually picturing my four-year-old. So I'd even go even even younger. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what an eight to 10-year-old looks like. But. but I tell you, Jen, I've had to do this. I've really, I've done it. I've been in rooms of extremely powerful men in my career and tense situations for whatever reason. I mean, I can, t- you know, we could talk on and on about why, but the point is, For me to be able to hold my own effectively, I need to stand calm and clear and focused on what's happening. And so this this technique uh, has worked well for me by doing that. Well, yeah, especially because it's it's more than likely they're talking to somebody who is in power or is is above them in the hierarchy of the the company, I'm imagining. 
Yes. Not always, but, and so when you think about wellness professionals and, you know, we all know that you can't plop a wellness program into a toxic culture and expect it to work. Right. However, it happens all the time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the poor wellness professionals out there are trying to do the best job they possibly can do and they're stuck. Not necessarily stuck. I don't think anyone's ever stuck, but you know what I mean? That they're in it, right? They're in the toxic work culture trying to make change. What advice do you give to them? Yeah. So I was one of those and you were one of those. And so what, what, I, what I focused on was having impact wherever I could. And for, for those that are going to be listening to this podcast, Jen, I think that so often these are, we are women often, as you said, in middle management roles. And so we have a certain amount of status and we have a whole lot of lack of status and lack of power. But what we always have is leverage and negotiation skills and impact. And so what I found is that I would look for the places where I could make a difference, where I could have an impact and make connections and deepen those relationships. Because when I've left jobs, I would often have people come up to me and tell me, the impact that I had on them while I was there. And and it wasn't because I had any authority over them. It was simply because I had influence and I used my influence for good. And so that's what I would always say to any wellness professional is continue to provide impact where you can, continue to be the authentic, incredible, helpful individual that you are because if you weren't that way, you wouldn't have gone into this profession to begin with. So there's so many awesome people out there really trying to have great impact in the workplace. And then the last thing I would say about that, though, is don't beat yourself up and don't don't be so hard on yourself either, because wellness is huge. And, you know, that wellness manager is one person and they may have a limited or very small team. And so you can't do everything, but all of us can impact somebody every single day. So impact where you can. Yeah, I like that. That makes you realize that you can make change, even if it's not the change you want to make, right? Or as big as you want to make it. That's right. And and you really can. And again, there are ways I think that we can support women to, again, speak up more, to step back, to build their confidence, to get a better understanding of what they can negotiate and how they can impact and influence in the workplace. And um, that's something that I think if anybody's really struggling in that role is to just, again, raise your hand and say, I need professional development. I want to take some courses here or there. And, and that's an area, frankly, Jen, the GW4W is going to be working on in terms of developing more workshops to really support women in the workplace in these areas. And to not to, again, it's, it's, um, it's about taking this toxic power imbalance and creating a situation where there's more equity across the board. And when there's equity, then there's less of these microaggressions, macroaggressions, because they rise and are allowed to manifest because of the imbalances. And so the more we're balanced as cultures, as organizations, as people, the better I think it's going to be for everyone. And we can get back to these cultures of health that we're all trying to strive for. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm excited to hear that because I think organizations need more of these workshops saying you know, I've been a manager in, in corporate and you get like the standard sexual harassment training, but it's obviously not enough. <laughs> so, no. uh, so some of these, are, I think uh, what a great benefit. Where can people find out more about you? And of course, GW4W. Thanks, Jen, for asking. Yeah, so GW4W stands for Global Women for Wellbeing. And you can find me and us at GW4W.org. Well, Nancy, thank you so much for your time and expertise on my podcast. I really appreciate the time, Jen. This was so much fun. One of the areas in corporate wellness where we seem to be a little bit stuck is around weight loss and our common eat less, exercise more approaches that are rather ineffective. If you're looking for a new fresh approach that is non-diet, weight neutral, and incorporates mindfulness, look no further. 
Am I Hungry? Mindful Eating Programs and Training is a way to help employees reestablish hunger as their primary cue for eating, recognize triggers for overeating, learn to balance eating for both enjoyment and health, and helps them establish regular enjoyable physical activity. Participants are encouraged to identify their own internal motivators and are led through a unique process that increases self-efficacy and healthy behaviors without requiring a rigid, unsustainable routine. There are quite a few ways to bring this fantastic training to your work site, all the way from live workshops to a scalable online platform. If you'd like more information, you can just visit my website at redesigningwellness.com. Feel free to put in a contact form and then we can set up a call to discuss more. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Whoa.